Okay, well, it's great to be here today, and, and here's the great news, is that if no one falls asleep and everyone laughs at my joke, my lecture lasts about 40 minutes. I got a few sleepers. Uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I need. Sorry I didn't bring my hat today. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't get the hat memo, so I'm a little sorry about that. But uh, my name is Mark Bondurant. I am an independent pharmacy owner. I'm a partner in 16 independent pharmacies. And my goal today is to open your eyes. And that's really it. So I guess I'd start my lecture today by asking how many people right now want to own their own pharmacy? All right, I got about five. So that means I got about 90 people that I'm trying to talk to today to say, at least let me open your eyes and tell you why that might be a path that you haven't considered yet. So let me ask you a few more questions. How many of you have a goal today, or maybe in, in your future as you look throughout your life? How many of you want to own a house? Most of you. Wouldn't it be easier to rent? Wouldn't it be easier? Because, I mean, if you own a house, I mean, you got to fix the roof, you got to mow the grass, you got to deal with all that stuff. You got to take great financial risk because you're going to spend maybe uh, who knows how much on a house. Wouldn't it be easier to rent? I know, you know, you got the neighbors that endlessly watch the reels of the Gilmore Girls at a high, at a high volume, or that their daughter plays the rap music at night. You got all that problem with renting, but it's easier because you don't have to think about it, and you don't have that financial risk. So isn't it easier to rent? Still, still we got owners, right? Okay, good. How about this? When you're looking for a spouse, how many of you want to find a spouse that totally takes care of your life and tells you what to do in every facet of it? So that when you come home, you don't have to wonder about, you know, what am I going to do tonight? Am I going to, am I going to watch the World Series tonight? Or am I going to go visit the mother-in-law? It'll all be taken care of for you because the answer will be we're visiting the mother-in-law. That's the rule. <laughs> or, you know, what? how are we going to raise the kids? I don't have to think about it because I've already got the plan. Here's how we're going to raise the kids. Isn't that what we're looking for a spouse? How many of you are looking for that in a spouse? No? No, nobody wants that? So what you're saying is, well, I've got one. That's good. All right. That's good. Anybody that wants to be that person, we got one looking for that, so we can put that match together, maybe. So, so let's see. So, so far we got people want to own their house. They want to have a little bit of say. Let me ask you about this. Uh, if you were going to risk a lot of money, would you risk it on something you knew about or something you really didn't know about? Or let me rephrase that. How many of you know more about pharmacy than you do about the stock market? Most of you? So, what's the better risk? Something you know about, something you don't know about? Something you know about. So, so here's what I get. Although I only have five people that want to own their own store, I got a whole room full of people that say they'd rather own, they'd like to have some say in their life, and the biggest risk that they're going to take financially needs to be about something that they know about, pharmacy. So I got a full room full of owners, right? Yeah, see? That's where we're headed today. So I'm going to try to tell you why that's a great path, why it's possible, and why it's something you consider. But I know why it's not something you consider. Because when you think about independent pharmacy today, many of you have an image in your mind about what that means or what it means to own a store and what does that individual owner look like or what does the, the sense of independent pharmacy look like and to a lot of you it looks like this it looks like a dinosaur you go well yeah you know independent pharmacy that used to be a thing right there used to be a lot of independent stores but now don't the chain stores run everything isn't, isn't that really where it's at, Mark? I mean, why are you talking about this? Because the chain stores seem to be where it's happening, or, or the clinical jobs, or whatever. But a lot of people think about independent pharmacy like this. It's a dinosaur. It's time has come. And, you know, I really like this picture about the dinosaur, because not only is he a dinosaur, 
but he's kind of wading around in this murk that maybe he created out of his own bodily functions because he's so worried that, you know, what pharmacy is going to come to? And, oh, I'm so worried. And I think that's what people see sometimes about this is what uh, independent pharmacy is today. But here's the thing. Today there's 22,800 independent pharmacies and there's 21,000 chain pharmacies. So is there an opportunity still out there? Yeah, now that's shocking, isn't it? How many of you would have guessed that? No, no, because they're there. And they're in every town, they're in small towns, they're in cities, there's still plenty of opportunity. There's $82 billion at risk out there. $82 billion of people that want to give you their, give you their money. 60,000 pharmacists are today employed in independent pharmacies. So, so it's not a dinosaur. It's, uh, we're alive and well, and we're doing great. We're doing great. So people say, okay, Martin, I got it. You know, okay, I can see where you're trying to make your case that maybe that's something I consider. But, you know, I'm not a business person. I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm just, I'm a pharmacist. I'm a clinician. I'm, I'm a scientist. That's just not my personality to think that that's what I want to do. I'm not a business person. Well, what I found as I prepared for this lecture and, and looked online about what are the characteristics of a great entrepreneur, and surprisingly, they're very close to being the same characteristics that make a great pharmacist. So I said, well, what, how do you have, even have an inkling that you might be a pharmacist? I mean, you guys aren't quite there yet, but at some point in your life, something must have happened to trigger you to say, you know what? I think being a, a pharmacist is what I want to do. And here's a few things that I think you might, that might have pushed you to be a pharmacist. If, if you're in the shower and you find yourself humming the on hold music from the doctor's office, you think, you know what? I could be a pharmacist. Here's where you laugh. <laughs> okay, all right, thank you. If you have an urge to alphabetize your spice tab cabinet, you might be a pharmacist. When you're buying your groceries, if you ask the clerk how much is my copay, you might be a pharmacist. Here's my two favorites. Okay, I know those weren't that funny. These two, I'm telling you. They're killers. All conversations to the grandmother involved around Medicare D and constipation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And my personal favorite, if you can't be intimate with your spouse without receiving prior authorization, you might want to go ahead and be a pharmacist. So, so those are the things that might have made you a pharmacist. So how about being an entrepreneur? One of the characteristics of an entrepreneur. And let's read these over. You're committed and willing to persevere. You're willing to take good risks. You're creative and prepared to adapt. And you can read the rest of them, but let's kind of go over them one by one. You know, is that you? You know, are you committed and willing to persevere? I mean, how many years are you guys going to school, for goodness sakes? A lot. I got to think that you're pretty committed and you must be willing to persevere. That's the characteristic of an entrepreneur. That has to be you. you know, are you willing to take good risk? What's, what are you spending to be here? A lot. That's a good risk though because it ensures you have a job, it ensures you have a lifetime profession. Uh, that's a good risk to take. You're willing to do it. Are you creative and prepared to adapt? I think you're very adaptable because think of you, how you studied in undergrad, what undergrad uh, was like and how different this professional line is and how you've had to adapt to say, okay, now I used to do this and now I'm doing this. You're very adaptable. You have the respect of your peers. You should. Uh, it wasn't easy to get here. There were a lot of people wanting your chairs. Uh, I was part of the interview process in some cases and I would see people come through and I know how difficult it was to get one of these chairs. You should have respect for that. Uh, are you motivated to excel? Obviously. And the last one I think that's really interesting about being an entrepreneur and what really kind of separates the, the good from the bad is can you make a decision before you have to? It's easy to react to things and go, oh, now I have to do this. But can you have the foresight and can you look down the road to say, I need to make a decision now about what I'm going to do. And again, as you went down this four-year career, you made that decision, I'm going to invest four full years of this before I ever even have to, to get there. 
So is it even possible today to own an independent pharmacy? Well, here's the thing. 90% of the people have insurance cards. In most cases now, we're starting to see some uh, uh, prohibitive networks and some restrictive networks, but for the most part, that customer has the same access to an independent as they do for a chain. And so size doesn't necessarily matter just yet. Could it change a little bit? Perhaps we'll get into that. Uh, but right now, you have the same market that they do. That's a real advantage uh, to an independent uh, in terms of what you have to pay for your goods. Uh, as you saw, there's more independents than there are chains, so there are, is tremendous buying power in being an independent. So the chains have some leverage there, but we can still stay competitive. And the biggest advantage we have is that our overhead is less, because you go look at a typical independent pharmacy and it's about the size of this room. You go look at a typical chain store and it's about the size of this building. Which one's easier to operate? Obviously, we have a little bit of advantage there. So it is very possible. But here's the number one thing that makes it possible to be a successful independent pharmacist. Is that if we were just in the medication selling business, then I could go back a slide and you could certainly make a case that the chains have it all over us. And, and we could, it would be hard to be competitive. But we're not in the medication selling business. We're in the relationship business. And that is the key. <clears throat> So if you don't hear anything else I'm telling you today, hear this. We're in the relationship business, and there is like there is the reward that you get for practicing pharmacy. And I don't think that there's any facet of pharmacy that can impact people's lives more than community pharmacy. And you go, well, hang on a minute now. How about clinical pharmacy? They're making life-changing decisions. They're making life saving decisions and, and, and yeah and I don't want to discount that that's also a tremendous thing that you can do but as a community pharmacist you have a chance not only to be an advocate for their health you got an advocate you can be an advocate for their life I've had I don't know how many people ask me all kinds of things as being a community pharmacist about advice and in many cases as you go out in some of the smaller towns there are very few people maybe that were college educated. You might be the only one they know. So they ask you all, everything that you can imagine. I had a lady the other day so talk to me 15, 20 minutes about she rented a farmhouse and uh, she's starting to get rodents into the house. She doesn't want to move because she doesn't have time, but she's scared to death of rodents and she wanted my opinion about should I move or should I put up with the rodents. Okay, does that have anything to do with pharmacy? No. But she just saw the pharmacist as somebody that was a logical person to say, okay, what do you think? I've had people sit in my office and, and ask me, uh, their 13-year-old daughter was starting to make bad friends, and, and how, do I, how do I think that they could reverse that and get her in with a better group of friends, and what could we do about that? You know, that and the reason was is because we're in the relationship business. We had that relationship. And the greatest compliment that I've ever had as a pharmacist, and the greatest reward of my career, unquestionably, I've, I've had great financial success, I appreciate that, I've, had, uh, I've worked with great people, I appreciate that, but the single biggest compliment was ever paid, was paid to me when, I, when this happened. Uh, one of my customers passed away. And so I was going to her viewing, and it was a big long line of people because she was a pretty popular lady. And, of course, the family was up at the, at the, uh, at the front greeting the people. So uh, I stand in line and I get right to where I'm the next in line. So there's a guy in front of me that I don't know. And the, the husband of the deceased says to the guy in front of me, hang on a minute, I want, you to I want to introduce you to the guy that's standing behind you. Because he is the best guy I know. He's my pharmacist. He made such a difference in her and my life that I want you to meet him. Wow. That's awesome. That's why we do this, right? You know, we're all going to get paid a bunch of money, and we'll talk about how you can make money in pharmacy, but I'm telling you, if you're not here, if you're not sitting here for that reason, it might be a good idea if you went to another building, because you are going to suffer in your career if you're not here for that reason. And we got a great chance as a community pharmacy
to build that relationship and not only add meaningful things to other people's lives, I'm telling you, that's the number one thing that's the reward for you. It's not just about that. That's your reward. So that's why I love community pharmacy. So what's the number one reason why that you should, uh, should consider what I'm saying? It's that. What's the second good reason? The second good reason is you can do things the way you want to do them. If you want to start a clinical program or an MTM program, no one's stopping you. It's all yours. You got it. Versus uh, you have to meet such and such quotas or such and such metrics at the chain store or that you're locked into doing things a certain way. If you, want to, if you want to have some say in your career, as most of us said that we would like to have, there's your best chance. There are tremendous financial rewards in independent pharmacy, and we'll get into that in just a second. And the third thing that people don't consider is that well, they say, well, when you own a pharmacy, doesn't it take all of your time? And the answer to that is initially, yes. When you're starting your business, it pretty well takes over. But in the long run, if you look at my partner in my business, uh, we have 16 stores and my partner Tim Clark, he has eight children. I'm not sure when he had time to find eight children, but he did. So, so now, what does he do? And if you ask Tim, Tim, why did you want to own multiple stores? What was your goal? And his goal really wasn't the top one, and it really wasn't the second one. His goal was the number three, because he was raised, he's a third generation pharmacist. And his father was an old school pharmacist that did. He worked all the time. In fact, I worked for his father. But Tim said, I don't want to be that way. I, I want to have control so that I can raise my family. I know I want to have a bunch of kids, and I want to go down a career path that enables me to be a professional, but also to have time for my family. So that's what he did. He built stores, and today he's got plenty of time for his family. So what does an independent pharmacist look like? I know you look at me and you go, well, yeah, okay, there's a guy who's about 60 years old. That's what an independent pharmacist looks like. And let me step back a second. Here's another reason why you should consider independent pharmacy. Because you're right. A lot of, pharma a lot of people that own stores look like me. Okay? If you go to a clinical pharmacist meeting, and it was a meeting of all the clinical pharmacists throughout the United States, a lot of them look like you. And you go, well, isn't that a good thing? Well, it is a good thing, except the job market is getting pretty tight, isn't it? So whose job do you have a better chance replacing? A guy that looks like me or a person that looks like you? There's another consideration that I want you to have. So what's an independent pharmacy look like? Well, one of them looks like her, right there in the middle. That's Kristen. And Kristen is, a, is an amazing story because Kristen's not even a pharmacist. Kristen is a sports psychologist from Los Angeles that moved to Bend, Oregon to be with her fiance. And as, she, as, as he was introducing her to his, to his friends and the people in the community, Kristen kept hearing the same thing over and over again. I'm so sad my pharmacy closed. My pharmacy just sold to a chain and it's not there anymore. And I really miss my pharmacy. And Kristen's like, well, why do you, why? They said, because it was just such a great place. It made me feel welcome, and, and we don't have a community pharmacy anymore. Kristen didn't know anything. She didn't know about, she didn't really, wasn't really even sure what a pharmacist did. But she saw a need in the community. And so she got some professional help, uh, help and said, okay, let's do this. And she started her own pharmacy. That was about two years ago. Today she's got a pharmacy worth about $700,000 employs about 10 people, and she's doing great. She's doing fantastic. What does another pharmacist look like? This is Hometown Pharmacy down in uh, Lucasville, Ohio. I didn't have a picture of Brandon, but Brandon five years ago was sitting in this class. And Brandon knew, and when I asked the questionnaire, who wants to own a pharmacy, Brandon raised his hand. He wanted to do it. And so he spent his entire career after school preparing himself to do that because he wanted to be a part of his hometown community. And that's what he did. He started a store there in Lucasville about two years ago. Today they're filling about 120 prescriptions a day. His pharmacy is worth about $600,000. And Brandon is looking at buying a second store. 
That's branded. Here's another one. And this one I, th I find really interesting. This is Laura. Laura's out in Oklahoma. And Laura had the job that if I asked the question to you guys, about half of you would answer, you know, what job would you love? And that would be, I want to be the clinical pharmacist. I want to be the head of clin uh, clinical pharmacy at a hospital. That was Laura. That's what she was. She was the head of clinical pharmacy at a regional hospital and left the practice to start her own independent pharmacy because she wanted to do more than what she was able to do uh, locked up into the corporate world there. So it's possible. Are there disadvantages to owning? Yeah, you know, is it, you got, it's a lot of responsibility. People are counting on you. You've got some financial risk and stress there uh, and stress. Your personal finances, yeah, you'll have to put up a little bit of collateral. And so your personal finances could be at risk. Although I would tell you that the least defaulted loan in all of business loans is pharmacies. And there's a reason for that that we'll get into here in just a few minutes. Uh, is the time commitment great in the early year? Yeah, it sure is. Initially, when you start a store, does it take all your time? Yeah, it sure does. So those things are, are the disadvantages. So how do we do it? There's three ways you can go about owning your own store. You can start one, you can buy one, or you can kind of do a blend of the two, which is called a backfill, and I'll hit that briefly here. So what's the advantage of starting a store? So there's no store that exists. If you look at Brandon's store there in, um, in uh, Lucasville, there was not a store there. So Brandon was going to start that store. It's the least expensive because you don't have to pay someone else for what they've done. Uh, and, you, and the other advantage is Brandon didn't have to worry about what was there before. He could say, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to build. And he's been able to build his own store that way. The disadvantage is that it takes a while for your business to grow. And so the whole time that it's not growing, then you're not bringing in income, and that can get a little scary to people uh, that haven't planned for that cash flow. A good, a good owner that wants to buy their own store would have planned for that, would have done their business plan, and they would have done a great business plan because they would have listened to Dr. Lynn in their management class, and they would have built that business plan, and they would understand that cash flow is going to be thin in the beginning, but there's going to be great rewards at the end. Uh, the other disadvantage is it's not an exact science. You could start one and you could be wrong. So how do you identify where's a good place to start a store? I always do say that. If, if you're going to eat, eat where there's food. If you're going to fish, where there, uh, then fish where there's fish. And what I mean by that is there has to be a need in the community. There has to be, a, if you're looking for a place to start an independent pharmacy, find some place that's filling a bunch of prescriptions. If they're not, if the town doesn't, if they're not filling any prescriptions before, they're probably not going to fill them after. So you need to look for places that have business, and frequently that's that's right next to really busy chain stores in some cases. For instance, if I went into a town and I was go and I looked and I saw these two pharmacies, which one would I want to start a, a independent pharmacy up and compete against? Well, you could say. I want to compete against her because she looks unmotivated and looks kind of lazy and perhaps uh, I'll be able to, to beat her at her game. But she also doesn't look very busy, right? Look at these people. They're cranking. If, if, if you get a fourth of their business, you've got a successful store. So eat where there's food, fish where there's fish. Where there's fish. Also, if you're going to start an independent pharmacy, think about this. Is anyone doing compounding? Are they doing delivery? Is specialty a, a niche you could do? Is there home medical, long-term care? All those niches that are hard for change to fill are great opportunities for independent pharmacy. Another thing to look for when you're trying to start a store is what's the population pie look like? And if you look at this map, you can see that there's houses all the way around that store. The number one reason that people come to a pharmacy is that it's close to their house. And so when you look at where you're going to start a store, how many people are within two miles of your, of your store? That's the number one location analysis. Is because, again, that's how you get food to eat and fish to catch. What makes a good location? Can you see it from the, can you see it from the street? Is it easy to get in and out? Can you get a lease that's uh, agreeable? And how much is it going to cost to get your store ready to go? Uh, those are all things. 
Another advantage, is there an advantage to having a chain store nearby? And there is uh, because of this reason. If you, had a, if you had a restaurant that you opened for a year and you were losing $10,000 a month because you couldn't get enough customers. You got customers, you just couldn't get enough customers. But you had a restaurant that uh, lost $10,000 a month. What do you think someone would pay you for that restaurant? Nothing, right? Who wants a restaurant that loses $10,000 a month? If you got a pharmacy that's losing $10,000 a month, what do you think somebody would pay you for that pharmacy? You know what the answer is? A lot. Because you know who's going to pay you right now in the market? These guys. Yeah. So that's what makes pharmacy the safest bet there is. Because you have, you have clients and customers, and, and, and a buyer of, an, of a pharmacy is looking at how many prescriptions you're filling, not necessarily what your cash flow is. So there's still a market even if you do bad. And that's, so there, there's your safety net. Don't tell them I said that. So that's how do you have a good startup? You want to make sure that there's already some business there. You want to have a good uh, location. And you've also thought about, okay, if things go wrong, how do I get out of this? I'll, I'll touch briefly on this to fulfill my promise because you did laugh at my, laugh at my joke. So uh, a backfill. What's a backfill mean? A backfill means exactly the situation kind of that I talked about with, uh, with Kristen. Kristen did a backfill. And what that means is a chain had bought out an independent and left a hole in the market. And so Kristen was able to go fill that need. So one of the things that if you have a backfill situation, and this is, this is one to really keep your eyes open as you go practice, because you may be in a town where this exact thing happens. And uh, we've had great success in our company. Let's see, four, four, six of our 16 stores are backfills. And what happens there is a chain bought out a local independent. So we, we talked to the people that were the key personnel. Uh, see, they make keys. They don't really make keys. There is two personnel. So, yeah, so there you go. You're trying to speed me along. I like it. You're getting it. You're getting it. It's good. It's good. So, so we had people that were working at those independent pharmacies. Well, when the chain bought them out, they didn't want to go work at a chain. They worked at an independent for a reason. They wanted to serve their community. So those people were eager, and they came to us in some cases and said, would you guys be willing to start a store because we don't want to work for a chain. We want to work for an independent. And so we capitalized on those relationships that the people had built for years, started a store, and in most cases have been very successful with that. The key to a backfill is you've got to do it quick. You can't wait. So again, as you, if it's in your mind that you want to sometime do, a, sometime do a store, prepare yourself. Have your ducks in a row before it happens because sometimes you've got to act quickly to do it. So the key to that is you got to act quick, you got to have the personnel to do it, and you got to find the location that you can put it, put it in. So how do you find a purchase opportunity? So there's two of the ways. You can start one, you can backfill one. The purchase is the single safest way to, to enter into ownership. If you go ask a bank, would you rather loan me a million dollars to buy a store or 400000 to start one, they'll tell you, I'd rather loan you the million. And the reason is, is because there you've got an established business. People have been coming there. You can look at their statements and predict about how much business you're going to have. So it's a much safer venture than, uh, than starting one. So how do you find out about it? There are brokers that do that. Uh, wholesalers, as you get into the pharmacy world, will usually know about uh, purchase opportunities. Uh, internet searches. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of simply going in and asking, hey, uh, do you have any interest in selling your store? Let's get past that. This is what most people do. You can buy. Uh, uh, so there's two types of purchases. The first I kind of skipped over. That's a file buy. And that's what a chain does when they buy on independent. They simply just pay you money. They take your files. They put them into their store. And they keep on going. They, don't, they usually don't operate that store. As, a, as an independent owner, that's not what you would do. You would want to uh, operate. So what's the advantage? Again, you've got people that have been coming there in some cases for years. They've got their habits. They know those people. 
and there's no reason that as long as you don't completely destroy it that they wouldn't continue to do that. Uh, the disadvantage is you do pay for that, and sometimes it can be a little bit difficult. So how does it work? You find your opportunity, you get with the owner, and you sign an NDA, which is a non-disclosure document. And so that way, uh, you promise not to use any information they give you to come back and bite them. So uh, then you get all the information, you look it over, you present an LOI, which stands for a letter of intent to say, if things are the way I think they are, I would intend to buy this. Uh, then you get a really close look, then you get down in there and really look at those emails that Hillary did. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> you get to really go look at that. Uh, that's called due diligence. When the due diligence is done, you write up a purchase agreement, buy your store, here we go. I'm trying to, to fulfill my promise here. So, let's take two stores that you can buy. So when I talk about financial rewards, this is what I'm talking about. Here's two stores. Here's one doing uh, the year of sales of 3.8 million, another one doing 1.6. To kind of so you can understand what that means, uh, the first store is probably filling about 230, 240 prescriptions a day. The second store is probably filling about 110. Okay, so what would you pay for that store? You'd pay a million dollars for the first one, you'd pay about 400000 for the second. We'll get into a second about, okay, where I don't have a million dollars. I'll get into that. So after your cost of goods, you have a gross profit of uh, either eight forty seven or three fifty two. It costs about 540 to run the first store, about 200 to run the second one, which leaves you $307,000 of operating profit, $152,000. You got a loan to pay. That's how you get the million bucks. A typical loan, an SBA loan, takes about 10% of the purchase price. So you say, okay, in the first case, I gotta have $100,000. And you go, how the heck am I gonna get $100,000? How am I gonna get, and that second case takes about $50,000. How am I gonna get $50,000? So let me ask you this, how many of you are gonna get into residency? I'll say half of you, even though no one held up their hand. <laughs> <laughs> And when you're a resident, how much do you get paid? About half of what you'd make if you, if you work. So how do you get 50000 Act like you're a resident. Don't take, your full, don't take half your salary and put it aside for two or three years. It's there. Act like you're a resident. Why do you do residency? You do it because it gives you career opportunities that you wouldn't otherwise have. You can do the same thing for yourself. That's how you get there. That's how Brandon got there. That's how Laura got there. That's how Kristen got there. Was they, they lived on less than they could have. They saved up some money and it made it possible. So again, you're looking at hundred to $50,000 of your own money to do one of these stores. So what does that mean? So then you pay off your debt. And I kind of ran out of, out of room here. So, what, so in this store here, you buy that store. After you pay yourself full pharmacist salary, there's still $150,000 left over. You've got to pay taxes on that, so it's more like hundred. But you can make an extra hundred grand. But here's the real thing. Keep in mind, for 10 years, you're paying this. So after that, you double. So the payoff for that, for that sacrifice, is that, and keep in mind, after you paid it off, what's it worth? It's worth a million dollars. Tell me what else you can do in your pharmacy career where you could work 10 years and have something worth a million dollars. I don't know. I couldn't. I was a staff pharmacist for a lot of years. I didn't come close to that until I was older. So there's great financial rewards with that. Even in a less busy store, you're looking at doubling your salary by being an owner, which is average. So. That's why I want to open your, uh, open your eyes today. So let me kind of sum it up so I can fulfill my promise here almost. Is why you want to be an independent, first of all, independent pharmacy is alive and well. There's still a bunch of us out there and it's still a great opportunity. The real reward to being an independent pharmacist is you can create your own career. You've got control, you can do things the way you want to do them, and you can be a part of people's lives in a way that you, that you just can't be in other environments. And the third, the third advantage 
is there's great financial reward for you and your family in there. So thank you so much for listening, for mostly laughing at my jokes. Uh, it's been a great pleasure to be here, and I hope to see you in a couple weeks. Thank you.